watching the time. I'm starting a tiny bit, tiny bit early. I realize UCSF time is 10 after, but I'm just going. But I wanted to, um, for those of you who have not looked at the website or uh, didn't look at the news yesterday, to you too. <laughs> is that like a human emoji? Thumbs up. No, sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, for those of you who didn't, haven't looked at the website, didn't see the news, just wanted to, uh, to um, make the announcement that um, Alyssa Apple was elected to the uh, Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine yesterday. Enormous honor. Yeah. Very, very big deal. 70, about 70 um, uh, new members per year this year uh, in her class. Four Nobel laureates were elected simultaneously, so um, it's it, it's no small feat to uh, to make it in. And uh, if you know, it's definitely worth a quick uh, email, or if you pass her in the hall, uh, give her a big warm um, congratulations. All right, um, so. <clears throat> Today, today was my Murphy's Law actually in full, in full bloom. So uh, on the plane last night, I uh, took down some notes to introduce Brian uh, on my computer, and then got here this morning, and my computer had no power, and I had no um, uh, cord for my computer, and things were moving too quickly. So I decided well, I'll just redo it. So I went to my desktop, and I redid it, and I printed it out, and I stuck it in my pocket, and I ran over here because I was running late, and some were between here, if anyone sees an introduction for Brian, for Brian King, if you have it with you, please, no. So, fortunately, I know Brian very well, and so I'm going to, um, Brian suggested I just go, here's Brian, but instead of doing that, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to wing it a little bit. So, um, we are, we are, um, uh, uh, very, very fortunate to have Brian here uh, giving our grand rounds this morning, and not just giving our grand rounds, but being our new vice chair for child psychiatry and vice president for behavioral health in the Benioff Children's Hospital. So tremendously lucky Brian is a world-renowned, uh, internationally recognized researcher whose work is really focused on uh, behavioral disturbances in, uh, in developmental disorders with a particular focus on autism and intellectual disability. He has over 120 publications, 124 to be exact as of this morning, 10 minutes ago, unless there's something I don't know. Okay. And um, uh, uh, over the last decade or so, has been the recipient of more than $12 million in, uh, in NIH grants, uh, winner of numerous awards. Um, including the Tarjan Award uh, from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the Melanchino Award from the American Psychiatric Association, both for, um, for his work uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. So um, he's going to talk to us today, um, I believe, about psychopharmacological intervention, something that, um, in autism in particular, something that's been really the focus of his more recent research. But I just want to let you know for those who haven't met him, that Brian is really the quintessential quadruple threat. Uh, in addition to being an outstanding researcher, he is a phenomenal clinician, um, a phenomenal educator, um, uh, and, and a wonderful administrator. So he, um, his educational path um, started at UC Irvine um, uh, and, um, uh, and then Medical College of Wisconsin Residency and Fellowship at UCLA. Um, and then uh, he's the only person I know who extended his education longer than I did in 2014. He received an MBA uh, from George Washington uh, University. He's been a phenomenal leader at, at multiple institutions, uh, head of child psychiatry at Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, and then chair of psychiatry for the Children's Hospital in Seattle, and vice chair for child psychiatry uh, at uh, University of Washington. Uh, in all of those positions, he's done a phenomenal job in, in building uh, outstanding clinical services, supporting education and research. Research. Um, I've also had the great pleasure of actually being trained by Brian, and so, you know, sometimes in psychiatry it's hard to know just how good someone is clinically, uh, but when you've worked directly with them, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to tell. He is the clinician's clinician. I, um, uh, I, I've, uh, there, when I see individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, honestly, without... <coughs> This is not hyperbole, introductory hyperbole. That must be sort of a thing. Um, 
that, uh, that I, I think back to when I was a resident and think about how Brian uh, would think about the case and how he would interact with families. As an example, he's not only won uh, Outstanding Physician Award and Outstanding uh, Education Awards from UCLA, but the Family Council at Seattle Children's Hospital uh, selected him as the sort of Family Choice Award for uh, Outstanding uh, Physicians with regard to uh, patient care and family interaction. Um, it's also a little known fact that I, I think it was very likely that I wouldn't be standing here uh, if, if I hadn't crossed paths with Brian. I was chief resident on his uh, unit when I was a second year uh, child psychiatry fellow. I had never done research and my very first paper and my very first research project were done under his tutelage uh, and, uh, during my uh, child fellowship. So I have both personal gratitude um, uh, uh, and now gratitude as chair, is that not personal? Um, okay. <laughs> that, that you've joined us um, and uh, look forward to your talk. Apologize for taking up a bit of your time, but um, Brian King. Uh, wow, thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you all. It's really a privilege to be here uh, uh, on many, many levels. Um, I feel like it's all downhill after the, uh, after the introduction. So uh, let me get started in, in, the, um, in the spirit of saying how, uh, how thankful I am. Share a, a photo taken from the window of one of the flights down from Seattle that I'm frequently taking. Alaska Flight 332, I think, on a, on a Sunday afternoon. What a beautiful place we live in. Um, and uh, what a beautiful place to be. Um, and so as I, I think about um, the, uh, the place we're at in the world, I know that uh, many of you, like me, are um, thinking a lot about current events and probably uh, checking the, the map uh, on a daily basis to see where the colors are changing and so on. And so um, I thought I couldn't uh, avoid going there today and so wanted to put up uh, the current map for all of you to see. So you see here that, <laughs> that we, are, we are right in the middle of uh, peak foliage season uh, in upper New England. Um, out in the Bay Area, you see that we uh, were sort of in the minimal range. So I particularly wanted to share the, the current events, that there are people flocking from all over the country to Upper New England now, they, they're called leaf peepers uh, in the region. And they're going to places like Fairley, Vermont, which as you can see is, uh, is just gorgeous. And here's another uh, photo of Lake Fairley, um, which is uh, again, a beautiful small setting in Upper New England. If you happen to go there, you may want to stay uh, with Titus. So there's a, a B and B here that's, uh, that's in Fairley, um, and as I see this sign, I think, wow, this is full disclosure. This, uh, um, if you're going to be uh, staying with Titus, you might be taken, and so I use this as the backdrop for uh, my potential conflicts. Um, so I've received research support from uh, Jansen Roche, NIH, and have been a consultant to other pharma. So um, as we think about uh, this wonderful season that we're in, I thought I would have that actually be the backdrop for the talk that I'd like to give. And the objectives today are uh, threefold. I want to uh, highlight the, uh, the current, or as I'm saying, uh, the beaten path uh, through psychopharmacology and autism sector disorders. Um, what you'll see is that the evidence base that we have for our current uh, psychopharmacotherapy is not very deep. Uh, and so one of the takeaway messages and objectives here is to highlight the need for additional attention in this area. Um, also want to highlight the challenges that have, um, been present, have presented themselves to uh, investigators in the field um, as we try to um, explore potential uh, pharmacologic interventions in autism. And then, um, highlight opportunities uh, for the future. So one of the things that every uh, child in Upper New England learns um, is the, uh, the poem, The Road Not Taken by uh, Robert Frost. 
And uh, so we're going to share that today, too. Um, it speaks about this, this, uh, this choice that faces everyone who goes on a hike uh, during the leaf peeping season. You know, which path do you take? And uh, so you can see here the, the famous poem, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood. And sorry that I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. There's another path that uh, people with autism and uh, related uh, disorders take, and that is this uh, medication path. You may not be able to see it here. The next slide is a close-up, but this is an exhibit at the British uh, Museum called Cradle to Grave, and it was uh, developed by uh, David Critchley, who's a video artist, Liz Lee, who's a general practitioner, uh, and Susie Freeman, who's a textile artist. And basically what they did was to weave together the 14,000 pills that the average Briton takes over the course of his or her lifetime. So down one long side here is the, um, the life with all of the events that happen for a typical British woman and the other side is a typical British man. And uh, it's quite impressive to see this row upon row, uh, path upon path of drugs that uh, the average Briton takes over the course of his or her lifetime, 14,000 uh, on each side. Uh, medication use is even more common in the population with autism. Studies that have looked at the prevalence of the use of psychotropic medications in particular have routinely come back with estimates that well over half of the population with autism is likely to take at least one psychotropic drug, in this case uh, by the age of eight. Uh, this was a Medicaid study that was done. Um, the other thing that emerges in terms of the current use of psychotropic medications is that there are three categories, three classes of medication that uh, almost always are in the top uh, most commonly prescribed for the population, uh, antidepressant stimulants and antipsychotic drugs. In a more recent study uh, that was done um, by the Autism Treatment Network, they uh, essentially polled uh, close to 3,000 uh, individuals, uh, their families, and asked, have you uh, received a psychotropic medication? Uh, what is it? And so on. And what they found, uh, which I think um, you can see here a couple of findings, again, that these, these run their way through all of the studies that have been done. Um, that the prescription of psychotropic medications across the, uh, the age range is common, um, and that more than one uh, uh, concurrent medication is also uh, not uncommon. So in this case, um, about 20% of the population is taking at least two, and 10% uh, taking three or more psychotropic medications. Again, the three most common classes of medication are these three stimulants, um, this is our antidepressants and antipsychotic drugs. Alpha agonists are also common too. So back to New England for a moment. Um, there's been another uh, more recent study that looked uh, not only at prescription use, but also at regional variation, which was really interesting. So um, what this study showed uh, is that um, in the 13,000 individuals with autism spectrum disorders relative to a commercial population of close to a million, or overall population of close to a million, that uh, the prescription, that the receipt of psychotropic and other medications uh, is very common. Um, and in fact, uh, although children with autism spectrum disorder represented only 2% of the population as a whole, they received 16% of all of the psychotropic medication prescriptions for the population. Um, and you can see that overall there's a, f a factor of four. Um, you're four times more likely if you have autism to receive any medication prescription and nine times more likely to receive a prescription with um, a psychotropic medication. And the interesting thing about the, the beginning look through these big data uh, studies is that there are other things that are revealed that uh, may not have been immediately apparent um, going into the review. And in this case, 
uh, it's interesting that the prescription of antibiotics early in the lives of these children with autism is significantly greater than the background population. And similarly, the prescription of antacids is also uh, much more likely in these very young individuals, arguably before the diagnosis is even made, um, they're receiving antibiotics and antacids. And one could take a step back and ask, uh, why is this? And at least many of us wonder if this isn't a sign that there are early emerging behavioral difficulties that people are wondering, could this be an infection? Uh, could this be a GI upset that's responsible for these very early, perhaps irritable uh, behaviors that some in this population might be exhibiting even before the diagnosis is made. So, um, so this is an interesting finding as well. But perhaps the, um, the most concerning finding from the study is the variation in prescription rates even within the region in Upper New England. So we're just focused on Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire here. Um, but there are several fold variations with the same medication in the same population with autism, depending on where you are in these, um, within these regions. So one of the things that uh, clearly challenges the field is not only identifying what the best practices are in terms of the use of medication, but also ensuring that uh, children and families have access to these best practices regardless of where they live. Um, it goes back to the findings that we all struggle with um, in research, and that's this dissemination and uptake. So as we're, again, uh, thinking about the tour of the current use of medication in this population, another study of interest looked at clinical predictors. So if we look within the population with autism and ask why are psychotropic medications more commonly prescribed? What, what are the, uh, the likely co-occurring behaviors or targets that are prompting the, the prescription pad coming out? Um, a nice study by uh, a group over in the UK uh, looked at factors that predispose to uh, the prescription of psychotropic medications. And I think what you see here is that almost any co-occurring at least I see almost any co-occurring behavioral problem increases the risk of the use of psychotropic medication. And with um, you know, any, occur any comorbid disorder, we'll put it up here as odds ratios. So having any comorbid disorder increases the risk by uh, nearly four times. Um, as you can see here, not unexpectedly, psychosis would logically increase the risk. But uh, other behaviors also. So um, I want to talk for a minute about these comorbid conditions uh, and come back to a nice insurance database study that was done here um, at Kaiser. Uh, Lisa Crowan and colleagues uh, identified 1,500 individuals, now adults, with autism spectrum disorder and essentially asked the question, what are the co-occurring psychiatric diagnoses that are showing up in the records of these individuals, these adults with autism, compared to the general population, and they did a 10 to 1 match, so identified 15,700 people in the general population as a comparison group. So what you see here in, in terms of the rates of psychiatric illness in this Kaiser database in the general population, um, not unexpectedly depression and anxiety disorder are common. One could say that this probably is an underrepresentation of the actual frequency, but these are people um, for whom the records are documenting diagnoses. And what happens when we, when we compare, when we look at the population of adults with autism? And this is what we see. That um, interestingly, uh, across the, almost across the board, the, uh, the fact is that having autism doesn't protect you from psychiatric illness, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but in fact increases the likelihood that you will experience a co-occurring psychiatric uh, disorder. And I just uh, put up the odds ratios here in the next slide. So 
the likelihood of an adult with autism also being diagnosed with schizophrenia or another psychosis is um, significantly greater than the general population. I think somewhat surprising perhaps is the likelihood of there being suicide attempts is greater. Um, and then we see an increase in bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorders, uh, depression, dementia, and so on. What, uh, what we don't see, if you wanted to go so far as to say that there may be some protective factor that comes from autism, it's across the substance abuse and alcohol uh, dependence disorders. So, so these actually occur in uh, about half of the population with autism relative to what you would see in the general population. Um, of course, another possibility is that people just aren't asking about these symptoms, which is uh, a fact that weaves its way through the field and has uh, for, um, for a very long time this diagnostic overshadowing that when you come in with a diagnosis of autism, that the search for co-occurring conditions um, isn't as robust as it ought to be. So, um, so now I want to go back to this, uh, this road this beaten path for a moment and, uh, and talk about uh, what the current evidence is um, for the uh, use of psychotropic medications and the targets that we use uh, in the population with autism. So here the next um, uh, verse we then took the other just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted where those for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. Um, here is a path uh, that I took with my family through the Northern Cascades uh, about a month ago. And I hope you can see this switchback that goes um, almost directly uphill. Um, and so I thought this was a nice backdrop for uh, irritability <laughs> with the target. And just to drive the point home, the other um, the other thing that contributes to irritability, at least if you're hiking that path with me, if you're so unfortunate to be a family member, is that you, you need to stop for every columbine um, <laughs> and, uh, and take a picture of, of those flowers. So there's been a recent um, meta-analysis of irritability as a target for psychotropic medication in autism. It is, has arguably been one of the best research targets um, in all of, uh, all of autism. And there are a couple of, of things that come, impressions that come from this uh, meta-analysis. Um, the first is, as you might be able to see here, that we start out with um, 1,850 records combined, and then we work through those that meet the cut and those that don't, and so on. And, um, and we end up with just 11 studies at the bottom of this meta-analysis, which actually represents 44% of all of the controlled trials that have been done in autism. Um, so, so a good chunk of these have been focused on irritability, as you can see. And uh, what you see here are the five trials that uh, have been done looking at um, using risperidone, looking at irritability. Um, and then overall, uh, the remainder, we have a couple of trials that have focused on aripiprazole, um, and then valproate, and amantadine, and uh, anacetylcysteine. So, um, so here is the result of the meta-analysis in terms of effect sizes for risperidone in blue and aripiprazole in red. And I think looking over all of these studies, um, one can see that the effect size is right around uh, one, plus or minus, and arguably somewhat better for risperidone than it is for aripiprazole. We have one study that um, came, uh, observed a pretty significant effect, others uh, not so much, um, and then arguably more on the risperidone side. Uh, perhaps the single most uh, important study in this uh, body of work of risperidone in children with autism was done by the research units on pediatric psychopharmacology. Um, and the conclusion here was that risperidone was effective, well tolerated for um, tantrums, aggression, or self-injurious behavior. And I'm gonna come back to these three targets that roll up to 
uh, the Aberrant Behavior Checklist Irritability Subscale, which has been used as the coin of the realm in terms of the outcome measure for many of these studies. Um, as you can see from the RUP trial, there were improvements across all of the subscales of the Aberrant Behavior Checklist. There are 58 questions that uh, factor analysis help sort into these five scales that have been replicated over and over again in terms of the, uh, the factors. Although there do appear to be some differences more recently when one looks at factors within uh, more genetically homogeneous uh, groups of individuals. So for example, if you picked a population with fragile X and looked at the aberrant behavior checklist and refactor analyzed it, some of the items on the irritability subscale would migrate over to hyperactivity and vice versa. There's a, a little bit of shifts there. So, um, so one of the other important things to highlight about this study uh, was that it was just eight weeks in duration. So a uh, relatively brief period of time uh, although ultimately this was one of the pivotal trials that resulted in the indication that came to resveratrol for irritability in autism. Um, based on this data, there was a nice uh, moderator analysis that uh, Gene Arnold and colleagues did. And what, uh, what emerged from this were some interesting factors as well that I think uh, also challenged the field. So, um, so if you have the benefit of higher socioeconomic status, somehow the risperidone helps you more. Um, arguably the only, uh, I think the most interesting measure here is that there may be a biological marker for potential response if you come into the study with a relatively lower level of prolactin. Uh, but then we see this finding again that those co-occurring conditions that we highlighted are so common in the disorder also uh, decrease the likelihood of a response uh, to treatment. So the other medication that has FDA, uh, an FDA indication for the treatment of irritability in autism is aripiprazole. This was uh, one of the pivotal trials that was done. And in terms of the road well-traveled or the beaten path, what we see in the field is that when one a drug gets FDA approval for an indication, that that becomes the path that everyone wants to follow because it, uh, it's demonstrated that it leads to a good place in terms of pharma. So if you get your drug approved, you you know, if they got their drug approved this way, then that should be the path that we look at as well. And so um, this um, protocol was almost identical to that which we saw for the Risperidon trials and used the same primary outcome. And this, this is the ABC irritability subscale. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, I just wanted to highlight another challenge for the field, which is um, that this is the primary outcome measure and what you see here, I hope, are uh, symptoms that don't have equivalence in terms of their clinical significance. So just to highlight that, I would, I would argue that the items that I've highlighted in red here are probably going to be more clinically significant than the items in green, the whininess, you know, the, um, and uh, uh, cries over minor annoyances and so on. But these all get equal weight in terms of the primary outcome and creates an opportunity for a lot of noise to come forward in, in the trial. And in fact, as evidence of that, um, Mike Amen and colleagues did a really interesting line item analysis of the data that they got from one of the aripiprazole trials, actually all of the aripiprazole trials, um, and specifically looked at this question, you know, what items, are all the items responding or not? And what they found across the studies, and there, there was a flexible dose trial here, and then a fixed dose, three fixed doses of aripiprazole. And I think in the next slide, we might be able to see uh, where these gaps are coming up. But um, so, so here's, um, here's what you see from a line item basis that, uh, these are the items that were most responsive to the medication across all of the trials. And these items actually did not respond at all significantly. So all of the self-injury items actually are over here in the non-response. And yet 
the FDA indication for this includes self-injurious behavior because that was an item on the irritability subscale. Um, so when it comes right down to it, uh, it seems like there's a lot of, um, there's some variability in terms of the response to two medications from the same class here, at least insofar as irritability goes. So another very common uh, target for psychotropic medication is hyperactivity. So this is back to that same trail, and this is actually the switchback, and I put this here because you can't really tell if you're coming or going on, on this. So, um, so hyperactivity has been a, a very interesting focus of treatment for many reasons. Early on, as many of you know, um, hyperactivity could not be co-diagnosed with autism. At least ADHD could not be co-diagnosed. By rule, uh, it was believed that the hyperactivity that occurred in autism was fundamentally different than the hyperactivity that occurred uh, in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so um, the field was not allowed to make uh, the diagnosis of the two conditions occurring together. In the DSM-5, we removed that trumping rule and so, um, and also the trumping rule for schizophrenia, which also prevented these disorders from being co-diagnosed. But in the run-up to that, people looked at, is it, is it true that hyperactivity, ADHD, is fundamentally different in autism than in the general population? And should, should we not be allowed to co-diagnose these? So um, Joe Biederman's group that had a very active ADHD clinic looked at this. Um, and essentially what they did was compare the symptom profiles, ADHD and autism symptom profiles, for three populations, one with ADHD alone, one with autism alone, and one with both. And essentially what they found is that um, if you look at um, hyperactivity symptoms, those with autism and those without um, have essentially the same fingerprint, and um, the same is true for autism uh, symptoms with or without ADHD. And so they concluded that these are more alike than different and ought to be, um, and that the field ought to be able to co-diagnose. So there have been, here's another meta-analysis of all the trials of, of uh, treatment for ADHD symptoms in autism. And once again, one sees that this is not a very long list. Since this time, there have been a couple additional uh, trials and we'll review those. One of the um, more interesting trials in this group, again, was done by the research units on pediatric psychopharmacology group, and they looked at the most commonly prescribed treatment for ADHD in child and adolescents, uh, methylphenidate, and um, did an interesting trial. Now, uh, there's some actually unique features of the protocol here that I think uh, many people wouldn't necessarily want to run up the flagpole uh, for uh, replication. One is that um, they divided the group into low, medium, and high dosage groups, but as you can see, there's overlap with each of these groups. So the, the high dose from the low group is the low dose and the medium group, and the high dose and the medium is the low dose and the high. So when it comes to sorting all of this out, um, there are obvious problems in terms of um, where one sits. Um, and the other thing they did, recognizing a concern in the field that um, many times when a clinician prescribes a stimulant to a child with autism for ADHD, the phone rings a few hours later from the family uh, questioning what the heck you were thinking. Um, there are many, many single trial stimulant uh, experiences in the population, many more than for the general population. And so recognizing this apparent increased sensitivity in autism, the investigators did an interesting thing where they gave everyone a test dose of the drug before they randomized them. So, um, so that also raises questions just in terms of protocol that you give everyone a sneak peek at your active treatment before you randomize them. Um, but, and, and what they found was that there was a significant number that actually couldn't tolerate any of the three doses and so they didn't move on into randomization. So nice thing from the standpoint of 
um, anticipating problems, but not so great from the standpoint of an actual blind uh, trial. Even so, what they found, and I have the findings over here on the left, the response rate, at, and what they did was pick the best dose, so rolled all of the responders into the best dose. Response rate was only about 50%, and what you see here is a pretty significant dropout rate compared to the multimodal treatment of ADHD study, which is the largest and arguably best in the field for uh, ADHD without autism, where the response rate was closer to 70% and the dropout rate was relatively small. Um, so one of the findings here is that in fact there may be a difference within uh, the universe of people with autism in terms of sensitivity to drugs that are otherwise commonly given. So the first line treatments uh, may not uh, translate in the same way to the setting of autism and argues in favor of the need to do these kinds of studies uh, using uh, treatments that are other otherwise well established. So we recently completed a study of an alpha agonist, guanfacine. You saw that this was also one of the more commonly prescribed classes of drugs, particularly for younger children with autism. We enrolled about 60 kids in the trial and uh, randomized them to placebo or extended release guanfacine. Um, and what you see just briefly here are the um, demographics of the sample and in light of the previous slide that or the earlier slide about moderators uh, people do pay attention to um, socioeconomic status and so on and you can see that there weren't any significant differences between those randomized to placebo and those that received active treatment and the outcome of this trial uh, was that um, hyperactivity symptoms as assessed by the Aberrant Behavior Checklist Hyperactivity Subscale uh, were significantly improved with an effect size of over one and a half uh, in this population. Um, and using another rating, it appeared as if uh, inattention measures also improved, but that didn't, there was no um, consistent inattention signal across uh, other outcomes. Um, here you see the uh, transition through the trial, and they enter in with a uh, subscale score upwards of 30. The placebo group sort of dropped a little bit, and the active treatment group is down here. I think another take home message from this and other trials is that uh, the drop from 35 or 30 down to 20 on this rating scale is certainly significant. But we're still, we're still up here with lots of opportunity for improvement. So there are none of the trials that have been done where the target symptoms are dropping down, uh, you know, to disappear completely. Um, and this will be important. We'll highlight another trial um, here in a moment. Um, you can also see that there uh, was a clear effect of the drug on um, uh, blood pressure and also on heart rate um, and, oh, this is a diastolic, sorry, and then heart rate um, and overall side effects, uh, which is another theme running through all of these trials, um, is that all of these medications have the potential to cause side effects and here drowsiness, fatigue, appetite suppression, dry mouth, and so on are more common. Interestingly, irritability uh, was also more common in the treatment group. And this raises another challenge for the field, which is sometimes there's overlap between your target symptom and your and the side effect profile of drugs. So we see this across the board, actually. But if you're focused on treating hyperactivity and irritability, and your medication is making one of those target symptoms actually worse, it's not uncommon to see clinicians continue to move up on the drug in hopes that it will rein in that symptom. And so you can see um, this um, happen uh, sometimes where uh, the first drug uh, 
uh, doesn't seem to improve things. In fact, you might be at a dose that is higher than what one typically might see. And then rather than eliminating that dose and moving up that drug and moving on to something else, a second drug gets added. The thinking is that, well, you know, um, maybe that's helping in some way. If the irritability is so bad now, imagine what it would look like if we took this medication away that's supposed to be helping with the irritability and so on. So it, it uh, does create an important uh, problem that people working with this population need to pay close attention to. So another uh, drug that, as you know, is indicated for the treatment of hyperactivity in the general population is atomoxetine. Uh, and there have actually been a number of studies uh, mostly in the Netherlands, but also recently in the United States, that have looked at atomoxetine for hyperactivity and inattention symptoms. And what I wanted to show you here, in this particular trial, there were 88 subjects that were um, put up to a dose of 1.2 milligrams per kilogram per day and followed for uh, 12 weeks. At the end point of this study, one of the outcomes was the clinician global impression of improvement, or the CGII, which is another common outcome that's used uh, in clinical trials. And this is a seven point rating that goes from four being no change up to one, which is very much improved, or down to seven, which is very much worse. Um, and usually, um, the cutoff in terms of clinically significant improvement is between, is two and below on the scale or above. So ones and twos, very much improved or much improved, typically are, are consolidated in an outcome that says uh, this is a responder versus minimally changed, um, no change, and you know, everybody could actually get worse. And so while the finding, this is from the uh, atomoxetine study over in the Netherlands, while there was statistically significant improvement across the board for this treatment, if you look at the clinical global impression scale, um, what you see here is that uh, only 20% of those treated uh, were deemed very much improved or much improved. This would be the population clinically that you would want to continue on the medication, right? Where if you're sitting with the family and saying, is the response that we've seen good enough to warrant continuing to prescribe this drug for your child, we would, we would want to see a response that's in the, yes, he's much improved, very much improved range. Um, so although, um, in this trial, there was clear uh, statistical significance. I think looking at this, many of us also uh, wonder about the clinical significance, and that is something that also winds its way through this path, this, uh, this beaten path. A more recent study combined atomoxetine with parent behavioral trading. And this is interesting for a variety of reasons, but the, the protocol here, the design, is that the groups were randomized into receiving uh, parent training only, uh, placebo only, atomoxetine only, or atomoxetine and parent training. And what you see in terms of the outcomes here is that the atomoxetine parent training group and atomoxetine alone group, these two lines, seem to do better than the parent training alone, but all of them did better than uh, placebo, and it's represented here in the pre-post. Um, each of those active treatments where, where one of the interventions was active did better than not on the primary outcome. One of the more interesting features of this trial, though, is when you look at the secondary outcomes, how these interventions performed, and um, one of those was the final dose of the medications, and in the group that received parent behavioral training, it turns out that the final dose of atomoxetine was lower than it was in the group that received atomoxetine alone, which might suggest that the potential for side effects is also lower. And, um, and perhaps also most interesting is that if you look at the irritability subscale, only the parent training group uh, responded in this. So here, we're giving the families tools to help understand and manage some of the most uh, troubling behaviors that are occurring in the setting of the child overall. Overwhelmingly, on their way out of the study, when families were asked, 
what was the um, intervention that you most preferred, they identified the parent behavioral training as uh, the preferential intervention. So um, we're coming down the home stretch here in terms of time. Um, so uh, you saw that uh, amantadine was also listed among those medications that have been used over time. Um, this made it on the list because of the use of the aberrant behavior checklist as an outcome. This is a very small study, uh, although multi-site, uh, 20 uh, children in each group, drug versus placebo, very short duration, only uh, over um, eight weeks total of five visits. And um, what you see here in the blue is the combined uh, clinical global uh, impressions uh, improvement. And so one of the intriguing things about this study is that relative to placebo, there were twice as many people on amantadine that were reporting significant improvement, clinically significant improvement. But the power of the study was not uh, enough to um, overcome a very high placebo response rate, um, which we'll come back to in a moment. So uh, back to these trials. Um, so this is a photo that also took on that uh, Pacific Crest Trail hike of a uh, hoary marmot. Um, and if we back out a little bit, um, you see my kids in front of the posing, <laughs> front of the hoary marmot. And I put this up to highlight repetitive behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so repetitive behaviors have been a target of the field in autism. It's actually arguably a, a core feature of the disorder. Um, you know, the, the two uh, primary features are um, impairments in reciprocal social interaction and restricted repetitive patterns of behavior and interests, as well as sensory sensitivities. So. Again, as you saw, one of the most commonly prescribed classes of drug in the field is the antidepressants. Largely, this is because of symptoms of repetitive behaviors, but also anxiety. Uh, we enrolled a number of people in a trial looking at repetitive behaviors as our target uh, using citalopram, one of the more commonly prescribed drugs because it comes in a liquid formulation. And, um, this is the outcome looking at the clinical global impression scale, the percentage of the population that were much or very much improved over the course of the trial. And what you see here is um, pretty much complete overlap in terms of active versus placebo. And looking specifically at repetitive behaviors, what you see here um, is also complete overlap. So the, the good news here, I will say, is that we weren't scratching our heads thinking there might have been something there that we just missed. Had we just enrolled more people, we would have been able to see the separation. Um, but interesting uh, slash uh, other news is that this drug that we thought uh, was going to be uh, demonstrably effective in this population, and which, by the way, continues to be used um, in this population, uh, did not uh, separate from placebo. And so on any measure, all of our secondary outcome measures, everything, there, were, there was essentially no signal here. So sometimes when you get to the end of that beaten track, as we did on the uh, Cascade Trail, where there's supposed to be a view, um, <laughs> there's nothing. And of course, we all are familiar with fog and its effects here in the Bay Area. So, um, so this unfortunately also characterizes the field that, um, that we can invest a lot of time and effort and money in these trials that go on for several years. Uh, and then when we get to the, uh, to the end of that beaten path, uh, we don't see anything. Um, and the view might be obscured by something that we wish we had accounted for in advance or not. And that's why we, we took the opportunity of this high placebo response rate to look at baseline predictors in this citalopram study that might have, um, uh, that might lead to some better understanding of uh, how we might uh, enroll the populations into trials that are going to uh, limit the likelihood of fog placebo fog obscuring the outcome. In fact, if you look at trials in autism, um, perhaps surprisingly, 
the, the placebo response rate is um, not uncommon and can be very significant. And all of these trials that had the highest placebo response rates, uh, not surprisingly, did not uh, yield significant findings in terms of the primary active treatment outcome. So we asked the question, if we looked at the population coming in um, and knowing what we know now in retrospect, are there uh, predictors that we might have been aware of had we known that would have resulted in a different placebo response rate? Essentially, can you tell when someone is coming in the door what their likelihood for a placebo response is going to be based on some of these factors. And we identified three uh, factors, in fact, that, um, that seem to, uh, if we separate on, on the population, just dividing them in half at the time they come in, um, the likelihood of a placebo response rate. So um, disruptive behaviors, those, the population, you know, this was a trial of repetitive behaviors. Some of these kids have disruptive behaviors as well. Um, if you separate the population in half and look at those who came in with relatively low scores on disruptive behavior measures versus those that had higher scores, in the low score group, the placebo response rate was almost twice what it was in the group without. Um, if you look at symptom burden, so mood symptoms, severity of autism measures, those that came in with relatively lower symptom burden indices were also much more likely to respond to placebo. And perhaps um, most interestingly, um, if you look at measures of caregiver strain, so there's a caregiver strain index, six questions, to essentially asks families, how are you doing? How much hope do you have that things are going to get better? How guilty do you feel for uh, what's going on in your family overall? These kinds of assessments of where the family is at, you see, uh, again, uh, almost a 50% reduction in the likelihood of a placebo response, over 50%. Um, but the other thing that emerges here is a possible signal for the actual active treatment. So if we, if we had enrolled people based on caregiver strain as one of the measures, for instance, and said we're only going to take people who have these repetitive behaviors, but who also are where there's clear evidence that these behaviors have caused a significant strain on the family. Um, we may very well have been uh, pronouncing a different headline in terms of the outcome of the trial. So there was an interesting editorial that accompanied the Guanfacine paper in the American Journal from uh, Graham Emsley, which highlights the value of this beaten path, um, where you pick a drug that's commonly used, you ask the question, does this really work, and you invest the time and effort to do the trial, and highlights um, that we have a lot of medications that are frequently used now that we have no real evidence to support their use or to better understand their side effects and so on. And, um, and this value is highlighted in this paper, which goes to the, uh, the category of be careful how you title your, um, how you title your paper. So, so this, this clearly was one of the enthusiastic early um, papers uh, supporting the use of virus. Of course, we all know now there are multiple black box warnings for uh, this drug and so on. Um, so, um, so there is clearly there's a need to continue down this path. Um, and I just want to highlight where, um, where this path leaves in a bit of a cartoon schematic. So. Um, you know, clearly all the action is happening here. We've got um, altered structure and function in the setting of autism spectrum disorders um, with uh, reciprocal interactions between uh, genetic and environmental factors. And way out here is where we, on the clinical side, are focused, uh, typically in terms of diagnostic categories or, or formal psychiatric diagnoses. If we move one step up, um, we see that this is the place that typically has been the focus in autism. We don't have a drug for autism. Um, the focus of the clinical intervention use of psychopharmacology in particular has been around many of these behaviors which are not specific 
for any of these diagnoses. In fact, we know that there's overlap in these diagnoses, uh, both in terms of, um, on the clinician side, diagnosing co-occurring conditions, but also increasingly on the genetic side, the uh, overlap in these conditions. And um, NIH is moving us uh, even closer here in terms of RDOC uh, category systems and so on, which will be a focus. If you look at the drugs that are currently in the pipeline, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, where you can see all of the registered trials um, for autism, um, here's what, uh, what that looks like um, as of a few days ago. Oxytocin is uh, clearly something that is of great interest. Uh, there are a number of trials uh, here and in Europe, 14 trials that are currently underway. Um, and so we're going to hear a lot about oxytocin and uh, vasopressin uh, going forward. Um, I think otherwise, as you look down this list, um, what you're seeing, in fact, even oxytocin, which is focused on symptoms of social communication impairments and social interaction, what you're seeing on this list um, are variations of a behavioral phenotype that form the target of our interventions. So at the end of the day, what's, uh, what is defining this path, this uh, uh, beaten path, is um, you know, varying degrees of, um, of behavior. In this case, uh, my son is showing me how much he can think. Um, and interestingly, just while we're on the subject of what a behavioral phenotype might look like, um, I'm pretty sure he does not have any thoughts. Um, and yet, he's presenting with this classic thinking um, behavior. So, uh, so just looking at how something uh, is presenting does not really get us to where we want to be, which is actually knowing that the person is indeed thinking and, in fact, what they're even thinking about. Um, so as, as we understand these behaviors, we clearly have a long way to go. Um, and, um, and this beaten path, back to Robert Frost, highlights the fact that, um, that way leads on to way. When you go down this path, um, you essentially have committed and you're going down that path and you're not coming back. Um, I want to talk for a few minutes at the end about alternative pathways that increasingly we need to explore and where the field is opening up for us uh, new value. So, um, in the same exhibit hall where that cradle to grave pharmaco drug, drugs over the lifespan exhibit is at the British Museum um, in, in Gallery 24, there's, there's an overall focus of different cultures and how we've approached um, wanting to extend our health or our lifespan. And one of the statues in that uh, exhibit is this Hakanana Ia statue from Easter Island, um, where the, or the, the island's uh, original name, native name, is uh, Rapa Nui. And there, as you know, these statues all over the island, these wonderful statues. Um, it turns out that another thing exists on that island. Uh, that was discovered in soil samples, which is rapamycin, which was named after the, the rapa people. So rapamycin uh, is uh, um, extruded into the soil to prevent other plants from growing in the neighborhood of the bacteria that are uh, making it. And, um, and there's a really interesting story that has emerged over time with uh, this tool, this rapamycin tool in hand. Um, and there are people in the room here who have studied this, I'm sure. Um, so this mTOR, this uh, mammalian or mechanistic target of rapamycin, um, keeps showing up in many of the pathways that are involved in uh, developmental disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, Peter Crino highlights um, in this review paper, this recent review paper, um, uh, that this mechanistic target of rap rapamycin has allowed us insights into this signaling pathway um, and that 
interventions, um, including administering rapamycin and related compounds to individuals with neurologic and neurodevelopmental disorders, are very interesting. Uh, reducing the size of some of the tumor formation in tuberous sclerosis complex, for example, and increasingly there are trials that are looking at autism symptoms as a potential target. In tuberous sclerosis complex, um, as highlighted by uh, Mustafa Shaheen's paper, in tuberous sclerosis complex, about half of the population uh, will be diagnosed with autism. And in uh, Fragile X, about uh, two-thirds of the population will be diagnosed with autism or with uh, another pervasive developmental uh, disorder. So um, he highlights that there are a number of clinical trials for tuberous sclerosis complex with uh, these so-called rapa logs. Um, and um, it's going to be very exciting to see these coming forward. Here's the cartoon that shows some of these pathways these novel pathways that uh, in the future we're going to want to explore with the tuberous sclerosis uh, genes products here um, and then this complex, the mTOR complex one, which is a target for rapamycin. Um, and you see the fragile X mental retardation protein here also showing up on this same pathway. So a tremendous interest in new approaches, exploring new paths uh, these alternative circuits that are not coming to us on the basis of a behavioral phenotype that's way out in the distance, but rather based on an inside-out understanding of what might be going on in the individual. Of course, uh, people here have elaborated, are elaborating the genetic architecture of autism, and we're coming up with multiple targets. So, um, so in this study, for example, the, of the 65 genes that are identified, they're also mapping into uh, common areas of interest that will form uh, targets for the new path, uh, the road not taken, but the road that we should be taking uh, going forward. Uh, another large group of uh, um, investigators coming up with similar findings where we have convergent pathways emerging based on some of the molecular genetic findings that are coming to us. So in the final uh, closeout here, um, this is a video that I took last week actually. I was in Russia and uh, you see the leaves literally falling uh, right in front of me. Um, I want to summarize uh, where we're going here or where we've been. So um, there have been at least some controlled clinical trials, clearly not enough and a, a need for more, that have centered on children and adolescents with autism spectrum disorder. And overwhelmingly, the beaten path has been to focus on these target symptoms. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that we do need to pay attention to that path because some of the treatment outcomes and some of the side effects may in fact be different in the setting of autism and related conditions. Um, there seem also, although I didn't highlight it here, to be some differences between children and adults in terms of response to some of these uh, common medications. The best studied classes of which include um, the stimulants, uh, the, the alpha adrenergics, and the antipsychotics. Um, and there remain very significant gaps in our knowledge. Before we leave this, um, I want to go back and highlight one more problem in the field that has essentially not been addressed, but which looms large for us. Um, and that is this. So also gives me a chance to highlight how those leaves turn colors. So. Um, so what happens in the fall as the amount of light in the day diminishes is that beta carotene production gets turned off in the trees and the, the lack of the ongoing production of beta carotene reveals the anthocyanins and flavanols and, and other natural occurring pigments that are always there in the leaves but obscured by the fact that chlorophyll um, is coloring them green. So, um, so the issue going before us when we take the new path, the, um, the path that uh, has not been so beaten, is <clears throat> imagine if we could restore chlorophyll production in these leaves. Um, 
so that we could restore this process of, of chlorophyll production and turn the leaves, uh, perhaps even turn the leaves green again. We can't put them back on the tree. They will not go back on the tree. There's, there's a developmental process that could be going on here that we have not even begun to approach, but it's uh, highlighted by the experience with thermal ketonuria with PKU, where we understand the biology, we understand how to intervene and treat the diet, but if we don't do it early on, the train has left the station, the leaf has fallen off the tree, and no amount of dietary intervention for an adult with PKU who was not treated as a child is going to reverse the symptoms of hyperactivity and autism and so on. And as a field, we have not, we have not um, moved into this space, but it's one that clearly uh, looms over a lot of the, the future progress. So this is the last verse. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. So I'm going to close it there and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. <laughs> Sure. So I'm going to repeat the questions because there are people listening from outside of this room. So uh, Summer asks, in those clinical trials that used a CGI as a measure, was there any effort to standardize the ratings across raters, either how they were taking into account all of the information, or to uh, assess more formally the reliability across sites? And the answer is yes. Um, there typically are, um, well, there almost always have been efforts to uh, assess reliability. So basically, me, people are given vignettes or presented with other data and asked how they would rate the change, and then that's compared to a gold standard of uh, folks that have come together and agreed that you know, these ratings ought to uh, be captured in this way. And that's done over the course of the trial itself. So periodically during the trial, you recalibrate, make sure that everybody is still uh, rating the CGI in the same way. There have not been, um, let me take this back, there have, there have been efforts to try to scope the information that's going into the CGI. Um, my opinion of that is that it's not, um, it's not helpful. Um, the thinking is that if you, and Bob's been at these meetings where people have talked about uh, scoping the CGI, in order to potentially reduce the placebo response likelihood, so that if you're taking everything into account and not focusing on the primary outcome, maybe you're creating a pathway in for other data that will influence a placebo response. My belief is that you can't unring a bell. If, if uh, a clinician sees or hears something, you know, Johnny is talking now for the first time ever in his life, and you say, oh, I don't want to hear about that. I, I want to focus on whether he's uh, repeating him, you know, whether he's repeating these views. So, um, so my, um, I've advocated that the, the G, the global in CGI needs to be global. That's the point. And in fact, clinically, if you were sitting with a family and, you know, you missed your target, but some phenomenal great thing had happened, you, you may very well continue with the treatment if you thought that it was related to the drug. Um, so the, the more important thing is, though, that there are efforts to, to uh, calibrate and make sure that people are on the same page over the trial. Dr. Steele. Uh, actually, one question for each path, but I'm not sure that's on. So on the, on the first path, symptom-focused treatment. Um, as a clinician, when you think about this, do you think about sort of statistical significance of the finding, or do you think about the number needed to treat 
and it was noticing sort of on your first slide, you had a few examples where there was a column on NNTM and the rest of the talk mm -hmm. didn't, didn't really do that. I just wonder how, how you think about this, just trying to sort of quickly calculate that. A lot of the stuff that looked like it, even though it was statistically significant at the end, you know, the number needed to trade looked like it was around 10, maybe higher than that sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about it when, you know, when you're trying to, trying to interpret the data? So the, the question is, um, as a clinician, when you're presented with um, a potential intervention target, do you think about the number needed to treat that, um, that um, is likely the case that seems to emerge from um, many of these trials, which could be, can be very high. In some cases, the uh, number needed to treat for some of these trials was 10, even though there are significant, uh, statistically significant outcomes. Um, and the, um, it's difficult to answer that question. I think if you, um, if you also are rolling in number needed to treat, then the placebo response is your friend too. So um, you think about um, the fact that in many of these cases uh, people respond, whether it's placebo or active treatment, so that influences the, the likelihood. I think um, in my practice it's more often the case and again, uh, Bob, Youngshin, other people who are uh, working with this population, it's more often the case that children are coming to us having failed a number of uh, the usual treatments already. And so we're at the outset moving into this place where we're thinking about um, choosing between treatments that have a relatively low yield overall. Um, and. Um, Again, it's, it speaks to, I guess, the number needed to treat overall underscores how we don't have uh, treatments. Probably also underscores that regional variability that you saw in the upper New England states, where in some places, what we're, what we're seeing there is practitioner behavior. Um, and some places where the, the clinicians are prescribing a lot and others where they're not, um, which is probably based on this. Too. So you had another trail question? Okay. All right. Okay. So the question, I think the question has to do with the relative side effects of the two most commonly prescribed antipsychotics or the two that have um, FDA indications for the treatment of irritability in autism and whether um, either the side effects going in, uh, risperidone and aripiprazole, um, how they compare and then also coming back out, um, how easy it is to take someone off of, of one of these treatments. Um, I think the studies that have looked at the side effects are coming back generally uh, suggesting that they're pretty equivalent. Um, it does seem uh, anecdotally as if the risk for weight gain and metabolic side effects may be somewhat higher for risperidone than for aripiprazole. Um, but the doses that are used in these trials are relatively low compared to the doses that we might see for the use of these drugs in the general population for psychosis, for example. So the average dose um, of risperidone across all of the trials is just a little over a milligram a day, uh, regardless of the age of the child, really. I mean, it, it varies, but um, even for adolescents, the typical endpoint dose for risperidone is just about a milligram. So relatively small compared to how these drugs are commonly used otherwise. And for aripiprazole, the interesting thing is that um, there seemed not to be a specific drug dose that emerged as optimal that um, in the one study that looked at fixed dosing, there were some kids that did just as well as at five as those at 115. In terms of coming off, I think I would make two points. One is that um, kids should come off. Uh, in the absence of ongoing clear evidence that the medication is helpful. And one of the things that we see all too often is that people get parked on one of these drugs. And at the end of the day, what we're treating is irritability and not autism. 
And we don't expect that irritability is going to be an enduring, unwavering symptom over time. Um, and so we owe it to our patients and their families to take a peek under the dose periodically to ensure that the medication still is necessary. Um, it's not uncommonly the case that someone will fail one of these drugs and then be transferred, you know, cross-tapered or otherwise uh, switched over to the other one and vice versa. Yes, Bernie. Thanks for uh, highlighting all the methodological uh, difficulties in this extremely complex area. I mean, basically, the message is it's very complex and there is no simple prescriptive result that we're going to teach our child residents how to follow this. And, and, and so we're saying, in terms of the scientific paradigm, we have to accept the complexity. Now, I say in the complexity, there's there is two big psychosocial variables, and that the design in the future should include a specialty clinics where there's intensive single case settings over a long time in terms of multiple variables raised in different areas. Uh, and in the previous studies, the randomized clinical trials, uh, some were eight weeks, some were 12 weeks, but, and then what happened? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't fit the actual reality of the complexity. Also, the placebo effect is for the for life of is, is not an empty capsule. It's psychosocial treatment. And, and the parental training is psychotherapy. And seeing a gracious clinician such as yourself is psychotherapy, mm -hmm. even if the person is basically making a DSM diagnosis and prescribing a medication. It's the way it's done, as Matt said. And so these variables should be included in correlational studies and intensive single case studies in addition to doing for future randomized trials. Yes, so you make, a, you make several really important points, and for the people outside, um, highlighting the complexity of the field overall, uh, highlighting that there are multiple interventions going on simultaneously, not just the uh, prescription of a pill or the swallowing even of a placebo tablet. Um, and I think the two things that I would like to follow up on in, in your comment are first, uh, that the placebo response, to just talk about the placebo response for a moment. Um, there is no way that I have ever been able to discriminate uh, a placebo response from someone who responds to active treatment. There, there is nothing qualitative about the placebo response that would suggest it's any less a response than someone who's taking the medication. In fact, in some of these trials, and you saw it on the, uh, you, you even saw it on the slide that I showed of the adamoxetine study, the one subject that was very much improved in that trial was on placebo. Um, some of the best responses in our clinical trials are placebo responses, where you're sitting with the family at the end of the trial and you're saying, you know, what if I tell you he, Johnny was on placebo, and they look at you and say, I will, I will march you back to the pharmacy, and we will open it up together because there is no way that all the teachers couldn't have seen this like they did, and that we've seen it at home, and on and on and on. And he was, you know, in this state before the trial, and he is over here now transformed a different kid. And sure enough, you know, it was the placebo. So there's, there's clearly something that's very important and active about what goes on in the embrace that a clinical trial uh, confers a subject and in our daily clinical lives. Um, and as, as was said, uh, there's psychotherapy that's going on uh, in a variety of different um, uh, manifestations that we can't take out of the equation. The other thing that uh, was highlighted is the need to learn from our experience and these end of one trials that would occur in the context of a clinic. And I think that that is another area that I didn't highlight here, but clearly is a problem for the field, that we do these studies. We spend all this time and effort. We um, have the people come through the study, and then when it's over, we say, off you go then. And 
not taking into account all that we have learned from this trial. And those people who did not respond to our active treatment are exactly the people that we want to study for the enrolling in the next trial because those are the people that are coming into our clinics who have failed that active, you know, the typical treatment. So we've, we've basically spent all this time on a really wonderful biomarker study where we've uh, assessed someone's likelihood of responding to a drug of interest and then we don't leverage that as we move forward. These studies end, the grant ends, and then you, you, know, you move on to the next trial. So thank you for your comments, Dr. Owens. Yes. It seems to me there's some similarity between the pharmacological treatment of autism and the pharmacological treatment of behavioral problems associated with dementia. Mm -hmm. In both cases, we have um, <coughs> syndromes where you start off with a very multi-dimensional problem. And, and I'll argue in that situation, you wouldn't expect one agent to treat a lot of people with a high ability uh, to treat. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me to be lacking in both areas. And you, you mentioned one of the studies but there's an item analysis of what actually did seem to be a response of the agent. And I think what happens, what certainly happened in the dementia trials is that you're, the investigators are pressed to use this scale that's reliable. So you pick something off the shelf. There have been very few uh, attempts in the dementia area to take a drug and look at what symptoms can treat in a, an array of people. Mm -hmm. And then try to go back and do your next study, just focusing on the symptoms that we're drug responsive. Very few attempts to do that. Right. Uh, and it strikes me that you, I'm not as familiar with what's been done in terms of looking at what symptoms do respond to the drug, and then designing your scale around and allowing that you're not going to treat a large number of people, you're going to treat a small number of people who have this particular symptom cluster. But how much of that sort of approach has been taken? So the, uh, thank you for your comment. There are, um, there are lots of parallels between um, what we've uh, just considered in terms of the approach to treatment in autism and the approach to behavioral disturbance in other conditions like dementia. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to expect that a single agent is going to address across the waterfront all of those uh, behavioral disturbances. And the question is, um, is the field, is anyone looking beneath these standardized outcomes at items uh, that are likely to respond and so that we can be more strategic in the focus of our clinical trials, enroll people specifically around treatment of target behaviors that we think are likely to respond. That's actually the advice that I'm giving to these drug companies that are asking about their potential compounds in development is to say before you, so the beaten path here is that um, you have to bet the farm on your primary outcome before you go into the trial and you better hope that you guessed right um, at the end of the day. So after all this investment, the, the uh, the path is that you need to declare up front what the primary outcome is going to be, and if you don't hit on your primary outcome, um, too bad, negative trial, even though there may have been a number of secondary outcomes that were very interesting. Um, and so what, uh, what I'm suggesting is before you go down that path, give your compound to uh, some expert clinicians and let them see um, what it does in their clinics. Let them get to know whether there are particular behaviors of interest that are likely to respond well before you're committing to some path. And then to your point, maybe in the future we actually need to design uh, more focused outcome measures that are um, not encumbered by all of the noise that comes from some of these otherwise standard ratings that diminish the size of the signal. Yes, ma'am. 
first line of care is often on us and are thinking, oh, this is going to help with the autism, this is going to help with the DPD, but mm-hmm. we all know there's no drug that's going to do that. Um, and how we can kind of, while the research isn't caught up yet, how we can sort of do more education to other clinicians to say, hey, let's be clear, you know, if my kid's going in, I want to know, well, this may smooth him around the edges, but he's probably still going to bite himself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What's the goal in that? Yeah. So I'm going to make this be the last question because it um, it will help us to end on a really positive note. <laughs> um, so as he says, um, you know, what's our role as an institution in terms of uh, dissemination of evidence and best practices around the use of medications in particular that are focused on behaviors and not disorders uh, that, that no one believes is going to address the underlying condition, um, and it's not just autism, it's uh, borderline personality disorder and across the board where we, where we have very complex um, behavioral and psychosocial dynamics all rolling into uh, one place and no one, no one would expect that a medication is going to be the single best um, uh, intervention and where we need to be able to move away from that or at least set appropriate expectations around what we're going to see so that we can lay the pathway to, to lead. And, um, and the answer is that, um, that we at UCSF are um, in the best position to address that. There's no one else on the planet in terms of the autism, um, for example, that, um, that can come together across all of these dimensions that I just highlighted today. Um, we have the basic scientists who are generating the, the pathways for us that we're going to be able to take in the future. And we have the expert clinicians that have been doing these uh, clinical trials, both the psychosocial interventions and the pharmacologic interventions. And we're on the, on the threshold of building out the clinical enterprise here that will allow us to do all of this here in a, in a way that no one else will be able to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.